welcome back to Teams On Air. This is episode 56. We'll be going behind the scenes with Skype meeting broadcasts. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining me today. I'm your host, Delonda Coleman, and today I'm gonna go deeper into one of my favorite technologies, Skype meeting broadcasts. Now, before we begin, if you have any questions, we are doing live Q&A, and there are folks behind the scenes who will be answering your questions, so make sure that you submit a question below or a comment. We'd love to get your comments as well. And also, we have the Microsoft Pulse going on on the side of the screen. So if you have, um, uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better, so make sure that you fill that out. So we'd like to know where you're from, who you are, and kind of what you do. And, uh, and that helps us just learn more about our audiences. So today, um, we have some special guests. We've actually pre-recorded uh, some content because we're gonna actually take you around Microsoft Campus to show you how we do use Skype meeting broadcasts, not only for large tier events, but also how we do this episode using the technology. And if you don't, we're also gonna show you how to do it with just a laptop and an internet connection. So this episode is definitely going to be one that you don't wanna miss. Uh, if you've um, missed the episode, always remember that if you don't show up at 9 o'clock, because we're using the Skype meeting broadcast technology, you can always tune in and rewind the episode and watch it on demand at your leisure. And we also, we also post our episodes on our YouTube channel, and you can access that at aka.ms slash Teams On Air Replay. And if you're watching it on YouTube, make sure that if you watched the video and you liked it, make sure you give us a thumbs up. All right, so before we cut to our guests, I first want to talk about what is Skype Meeting Broadcast. Uh, Skype Meeting Broadcast is our a way for you to stream live up to 10,000 uh, attendees your video. It's a great way to engage your global audiences with live video. You're able to deliver very large scale productions. You're able to have built in intelligence and we'll talk about some of those intelligent features like translation and transcription into the uh, into the stream. And then finally, you, you're able to use the familiar tools that you already use today, which is the Office 365 portal, as well as a laptop and some audio devices. Now, obviously, you can do a lot more complex complicated things um, than just streaming. Uh, so I want to talk about a little bit of some of the features and functionalities that are embedded within Skype meeting broadcast. So first, it allows you to do streaming up to 10,000 uh, uh, attendees. And then you can use very basic audio or video equipment, such as your laptop, or you can have a much more advanced uh, uh, audio uh, video equipment, which we'll talk about later. You can deliver worldwide, um, and it's delivered through our Azure. Um, we deliver you, we have a content delivery network that, and we have 40 global data centers all across the world that help distribute this content. Um, and you can also have solutions from our partners to help you mitigate bandwidth constraints. So we're gonna talk about that. So when sometimes when you're streaming to tens of thousands of employees, you wanna have to, you want, and they're all in your internal network, you're gonna have some constraints. So we're gonna talk about how to mitigate those a little later. And then we also have lots of producer controls. I'm not gonna go into this in uh, a lot of detail. Uh, we'll also wrap this up in a blog so that you can get a little bit more understanding. But some things like uh, things like being able to switch and manage multiple different presenters. You can have presenters who are physically in the room with you or sitting next to you. Um, or you can have presenters that are connected globally and remotely uh, with just a laptop and an internet connection. So it's a great tool for you to use if you definitely want to do one directional communication to a large-scale audience. Now, as I mentioned earlier today, we're going to talk about three different types of event types. Uh, the first is tier one events. That is if you have an executive or you have a very big uh, conference and you want to have a streaming and you have a production crew and you have um, a studio, lots of studio grade equipment, we're going to show you how tier one events, um, what kind of types of equipment that they use and how they send that video stream to Skype meeting broadcast. Then we're going to show you how we do um, 
a middle tier event that you don't have a large production crew, but you have some investment and in some uh, technology. Uh, so we're going to show you how that's done. And actually, we're going to show you how we do this with teams on air. And then lastly, we're going to walk through a scenario where if you don't have any of those, if you don't have a crew, you don't have production or studio grade quality materials, you can actually just use your laptop. And that's it. And so um, first, let's show you how we do it here at Microsoft. These work, I'm going to show you how we do a tier one event here at Microsoft and the equipment and, uh, and a, a concept that we call the Video Village. And I'm going to take you to the Video Village and show you how that's done. So take a look. <laughs> Jeff Fairbanks, and I'm going to show you some of the equipment we use for uh, our production. This is our audio mixing board. Uh, we use this to bring in all of our audio, not only from the microphones on set, but also some video playback and any devices that we have that need audio. This can have up to 64 input channels, so it gives us a lot of ability to have really high quality broadcast audio. This is our HyperDeck. This is, allows us to do video playback and record backups on our solid state drives. Um, we use scan converters, uh, yellow bricks down here for any devices or any inputs that we have that need scan conversion. Gives us the ability to kind of bring in multiple uh, different inputs for the show. This is where we have our video switcher, uh, our technical director and our director for the show. Uh, it's a mobile uh, video switcher that we bring out in our fly pack. Uh, allows us to go anywhere on campus, even off campus if we'd like. All of this is sent back to our control room back at Microsoft Production Studios via IP. We have three PMW 300s and one of them on a jib arm that we use for our floating camera effect. It really adds something to our production, gives us the ability to give you a really smooth, clean look. All of this is uh, running hard wires back to Video Village. Normally we're inside, but today we're outside, but we are using um, some uh, additional lighting to supplement our stage. We have some M18s up here that give us kind of a daylight look. Uh, we've also mounted some lights within uh, the structure here to light our audience as well as our Q&A position over here as well. So we do supplement this beautiful natural light with some of our lighting just for cameras. Our crew is about 20 people. It has everything from the lighting department, our camera department, our set designers, our technical director, our director, and then a team of producers that help put this together. A lot of work goes into this behind the scenes ahead of time to be ready to put the show on every month. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that video. That's how a production gets pulled together from behind the scenes. Now, all of that actually happens before the content is streamed to Skype for Business. And as Jeff mentioned, that uh, d uh, video feed is then sent via IP back to our production studios. So the next interview that I'm going to show you is actually behind the scenes at Microsoft's production studio. And, and we're going to walk you through the different types of scenarios that we run. Now, the scenario that Teams on Air uses is the Tier 2, which is basically we have some production equipment. I definitely don't have a 20-person crew running this event, but I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, let's cut to our interview with uh, Jeff Tyler, who runs uh, uh, our streaming center at Microsoft Studios. I'm your host today. I'm Delonda Coleman, and I am joined today by Jeff Tyler. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Jeff is the digital experience lead here at Microsoft Studios, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what this room is and what does it do. Yeah, so as the media experience lead, um, I, it's really program management for our video streaming and online experiences for our um, both internal and public facing events. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and what we do here um, in the, this is, this, as Delonda mentioned, this is the Microsoft uh, broadcast and streaming center and what we do here is um, this is really the aggregation point for video streams from all around the world so we have um, a very large company in a lot of different regions um, and this is where we bring back all of our video feeds for broadcast and we have experts here who focus on delivering those streams uh, out to our remote audiences tell us what happens after um, they're done the production crew is done on site 
Yeah, so, um, you know, as you saw in the video, we have about, you know, a 20-person crew there um, that's really managing that on-site experience and taking care of the, the overall video production. Um, and then what we want to do is bring it back here where we have our, our streaming experts. So that way the people in the room are really focused on the actual production itself. And we have other people here that are focused on the online experience and making sure that it's getting out to our remote audiences. Um, so what we do there is, is depending on where the, the, the events are taking place, we have a number of ways to bring feeds back uh, here to our, our video facility um, at Microsoft Studios. And we do that via um, a combination of, we have video fiber at a lot of locations, we use a lot of IP streams, and we usually try and do a couple different methods to make sure that uh, we have full redundancy in those pads. Then we bring it back here, we bring it into our infrastructure, um, which includes things like multiple um, machines dedicated for Skype meeting broadcast joined to each meeting. So that way, if there was a machine failure or a failure of a network segment, um, we actually have those machines on separate networks, so that way we'd still be able to stay on the air. So we basically have both joined to that inner Skype call mm -hmm. uh, that manages the meeting, and if, if one of them were to fail for some reason, we'd just switch right over to the other one yeah. and be able to continue on the air. Yeah, so you build redundancy into that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Cool. All right, so everything flows to your dedicated machines, and so what happens from a client perspective? How do you load it up on the Skype for Business client? Yeah, so what we do is, is always just schedule the meeting via broadcast.skype.com portal. Um, you know, pick which features we want to have there, and then we bring that feed here into the building into our machines, and it's really just opening Skype for Business, joining the meeting, um, and hitting start broadcast. And from there, the feed is going out to our audiences all around the globe. Yeah, it's really that simple. And so some of the features that you can have uh, pick in the skype.broadcast.com portal, you can pick um, uh, translation and transcription, and you can pick up to six different languages in which that you can have it transcribed to. You can also uh, be able to do some really cool things like at introduce the Bing Pulse. So if you want to ask specific questions and do real-time sentiment analysis, you can set that up and configure that right into the portal directly. Yeah, in fact, the, the, um, the, the Pulse and the um, Yammer integration are features that we use for just about every broadcast. Yeah, um, and so <laughs> even though we have a, a, a studio like this, I feel like I'm in CNN right now, but <laughs> <laughs> even though we have all those uh, equipment going uh, and, and folks supporting it, you know, all they do is just send a stream to Skype meeting broadcast and it's uh, really that simple. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. We're going to now talk about how we do this episode, Teams on Air, and kind of show you some of the equipment that we use to do a much more um, higher-end production without necessarily the, with the, such a large production crew. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about is video. Um, we use a one camera shoot, so we try to keep it simple and cost effective and um, you can do that with any um, HD camera. So right here I have a, um, a Canon camera. This is a high definition camera and it's, so it's really good so that it's portable. So if the person, you know, the cameraman wants to be able to move around, he can or they can just station this on the tripod. Um, and then what's also nice is that it has uh, XLR inputs for audio. So it can take, it has two channels for audio input so that the audio and video can be in one source and then you can feed that source uh, to uh, your PC. Um, from an audio perspective, uh, we typically shoot the teams on air with a boom mic. So that's a mic that usually is just kind of like hanging over our heads out, out of the shot of the camera. Um, but for today, we're actually using lavaliers uh, right here. So, so this is a really good um, uh, alternative, especially when you have like this interview style um, really close and then you can have multiple people in the shot. So, and one of the good tips that uh, Jeff like, likes to mention is that if you have multiple cam uh, excuse me, multiple audio inputs, using um, an audio mixer is really helpful. Any tips about audio mixers? Yeah, you know, I think it's all about finding the right size for your production. So we have a few examples here of about the smallest mixer in the world. Um, this guy is great because it's got a USB um, output that'll interface right into your PC and be recognized as a microphone by uh, Skype for Business. Um, this is actually a very simple uh, single mic input, but if you had some other sources, maybe some video playout sources, you could use those um, from these other inputs here. Uh, this little guy here is a two mic input, so just great if, you know, for something like this would be a good size, you set the levels and just kind of let it go. Again, a USB input directly to your PC that acts um, 
as a microphone input to Skype for Business. And then you've got a whole different range of sizes of more professional mixers. Um, this here is a Mackie mixer that you can see um, has a few more channels and, and for a little bit larger production, mm -hmm. you have a few more mics, a few more sources, lets you mix all those and set the levels on those. Um, most of these more professional mixers, um, the newer ones might have the USB output, a lot of them don't. Um, for that though, you could still do something like feed it into your uh, PC's microphone input manually, or do like you said, this could actually feed into uh, the audio inputs there on the camera to get that right there right. into into the, um, into the video source and make sure that your audio and video stays in sync. Yeah, and these are really affordable. It's not, you, you know, obviously the more channels and inputs that you have on the mixer, the more expensive the mixer is going to be, but you can have a very cheap, uh, a cost-effective mixer for, you know, probably 20 bucks, and you can find that on Amazon or, you know, just, you know, do an internet search. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, adding creative elements or adding um, using a uh, video switcher technology. So we use a video switcher um, that's small and portable. We actually use the, the new tech uh, TriCaster, uh, the mini TriCaster actually, and it's really great. Um, this enables us to take four HDMI inputs. It also has multiple audio inputs. And so we can actually send the video feed as well as the audio feed directly to the mixer. And so, and we can do some, um, uh, mixing of both the audio and the video technology at the same time. So that's really cool. Uh, the other element that it allows us to do some creative elements. So if you could think about lower thirds, we can add actually lower thirds to this conversation. And if you can see the animation <laughs> go right by, that's pretty cool. It allows us to also pipe in PowerPoint presentations. Or if we have pre-recorded content, like you know Jeff Fairbanks' interview that we just shared, that's all done thanks to a video mixer. So it's really cool. Um, the number one benefit of that is that, again, I can't, <laughs> I can't be in this, in this streaming center all day, um, and, and I can, or I don't have a 20-person crew, and you know, I can actually put this in a backpack and be very portable and mobile with it. So I think that's really awesome about it. Absolutely. In fact, we actually find that, um, you know, as, as we mentioned, this is sort of the, the, the big broadcast center for um, Microsoft events. But we have teams all around the globe that actually are using the TriCasters because they're, they're cost effective, they're portable, um, and they give you a lot of uh, professional production capability yeah. uh, in a simple package. Yeah, so many, uh, many of our other teams that do their own video broadcasting use that as well. So it's pretty cool. All right, I want to talk about, before we switch gears to um, a more basic level event, I think a really cool one is the fact that my production crew, so what does that look back? Obviously, we have some people in the background. Um, we don't have 20 people. We actually have a two-person production crew. So um, we have a videographer, and he has a dual job because it's only a one-camera shoot. He's also running the mini TriCaster. Um, so I think that's really important, especially if you're going to start adding um, a multiple different video sources and audio input that you have someone on hand to be able to handle um, all th the different technologies. So. Um, um, and then we also have the second person that we have is a producer. So she's actually running the Skype meeting broadcast meeting. Uh, she sets up the meeting and she also is managing uh, the clients. And so if we're switching uh, in the Skype meeting broadcast uh, to different audio, if we're switching between the TriCaster or someone's PC, because sometimes we do a lot of demos with PCs, uh, we make sure that uh, we have someone on hand who can handle that switching technology. Uh, one important thing that some people always miss is just muting and unmuting the different video sources, and so that person's also doing that as well. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty cool. Uh, the last thing, this little device right here, uh, this is one of the most important pieces of Skype meeting broadcast. I think everyone always asks that what this is and like how do I actually play video content um, or take uh, content from an HDMI source and feed it into Skype meeting broadcast. Do you want to share what this is? Yeah, absolutely. So this guy right here, uh, this is a little Magewell um, USB capture HDMI. There's also an STI version for those using um, uh, sort of higher level production gear. And what this does is it just takes that video source, brings it right into your PC as a USB input, and Skype for Business will recognize it as a webcam. Uh, so once you plug it in, basically, you have your video source um, there, and this will work. Uh, it's a great way to bring in just about any type of camera, any type of video source that you want to bring in um, into your PC. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, this is really, again, this is another really cost effective way of having, um, bringing in multiple uh, different video sources. So uh, definitely want to check this out or um, um, a brand similar to it. So um, that's how we do Teams on Air. It's really simple. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we use, a, you know, we pretty much use just one camera and some audio. And then because, you know, we want to add some creative elements to the show, we use a video mixer. And so you can do that too. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize that, you know, this is, this does require some investment and some technical aptitude or if you're just willing to learn it. And I think a lot of our uh, viewers probably are, but if you're not there yet, you don't need Jeff, unfortunately, we don't need a CNN type studio. <laughs> it's not for everybody. It's, yeah. it's all about finding the right size production for uh, for what fits your needs. Exactly, and you definitely don't need a mixer and an audio mixer or a switcher. You don't need all of these things. You can actually really just get started um, with a laptop and a couple of pieces of an equipment that will probably function better than the internal microphone on your uh, laptop. Or um, uh, So you can certainly use the video uh, camera that's in your PC today. So here, you know, this is a PC that I have and there's a video uh, camera in it. I could use that if I want to um, and certainly just get started, but I definitely recommend um, some sort of external audio device um, that can help pick up some really great sound. One example is this Jabra uh, Puck device. Um, it's a, um, it's really cool, it, you know, picks up a lot of great sound quality. Jeff, do you have a lot of internal clients here at Microsoft that use this? Yeah, in fact, we, we see this, this style of mic is what's, what's called omnidirectional, so it picks up sound from all around. And we th think that's a great option for something where maybe you have a few people in a room and you just want to pick up all their all their audio at once without having to mic them all up and, and go through mixers. Um, and it's a it's a great option for that. Um, it's not necessarily the best option if you're just one person that's that's presenting um, because it's going to pick up any other room noise. So for something like that, we would recommend going with something like this over here, for example, this this Blue Yeti mic that has a directional. Uh, options for directional sound, so that way it's really going to be focused on picking up the sound here and less likely to pick up sound from other people in the room, um, especially if you have maybe people supporting you and producers or or even just you know people helping. Um, someone shuffling papers in the background or typing on a keyboard uh, may actually be enough um, background noise that this will pick it up, uh, but this is much less likely to. Yeah, and it takes it's uh, just works with USB, so it takes USB input and you can connect it directly to your PC. Uh, it's pretty simple and it, it automatically recognizes it as a microphone. And we actually had a, have a story about that where um, one of our executives uh, does a monthly um, Skype meeting broadcast for, for his entire organization um, and was, was using one of these style pucks um, originally, and, but it was really just him speaking and what we found was that there was, um, we were getting a fair amount of background noise and some complaints about audio in general. Uh, so we actually, um, you know, brought them a, a Yeti mic to try, and once they did that and had that directional mic, um, it was a game changer. It really made a huge difference in audio, and as we mentioned earlier, you know, something like audio always seems like an afterthought to people, but really that's where you get the most complaints or the most satisfaction, because um, that really is the heart of the content a lot of times, just as much or even more so. Uh, than what's being shown in the video. Yeah, great point. Um, one of the, the other uh, things in terms of peripheral devices that I want to mention is just having a web camera, um, an external web camera above and beyond the one that's built into your machine. Here we have the Logitech Brio. Um, it's really cool. We have a lot of executives or um, folks who are hosting uh, large-scale meetings that will just hook this up to their machine uh, and put, them in, uh, put it in front of them and just start talking. And, and that's about it. And so it just really helps uh, with the coloring, um, the lighting, the, it has some built-in functionality like face recognition and things like that that are really uh, helpful um, and can and go a long way in terms of focusing. Absolutely. I think what, you know, what we've seen is that uh, webcams have come a long way over the years and, and people sometimes have this image of their head of, of the, the old style, you know, really, really poor quality webcams and really for you know, $100 or less, you can actually get something that's um, HD and, and like you said, great color and great quality, um, which can be great for a smaller production. All right, so that's an example of using uh, audio, an external audio device as well as an external um, camera 
to help with the quality. You can also think about introducing uh, multiple em elements in terms of there's multiple presenters. So, so you can uh, bring in multiple presenters on their own PC using their own audio and their own um, video, uh, and then streaming that over the Skype meeting broadcast client. It's, and, you know, and you can think of, you can add as many presenters as you like. You're not limited to the number of presenters that are physically in the room. Um, many of the Skype meeting broadcasts that we do internally actually have speakers that are located in other locations. Again, we have 140 locations across the globe. Um, we've also um, done Teams on Air where we've had guests um, from London um, piping in on the Skype meeting broadcast client. So all they need installed on their desktop is the Skype meeting broadcast, or excuse me, Skype for Business client, and then um, whatever hardware and, uh, and video device that they choose to use. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so in terms of creative elements, definitely you can use uh, PowerPoint presentations. You don't need a video mixer. You can build your PowerPoint presentations uh, using uh, and, then, uh, and then share those PowerPoint presentations in the Skype meeting broadcast client. There's you know, ways for you to upload content there. And so we definitely uh, uh, want to emphasize that you, you can build transitions or lower, effectively lower thirds uh, into the PowerPoint presentation. And so so if you have someone behind the screen, they can switch between the PowerPoint presentation and uh, the presenter. And so they, and they can switch different layouts so they can have different content layouts. So you can have the content in full view or you can have the content next to the speaker or you can have the speaker in full plain view. So something to think about, something to play around with, you know, um, as well as a way of bringing in uh, vis video elements. The other thing, uh, another popular question that I get is if they had pre-recorded content, how do I bring pre-recorded content into a Skype for Business meeting? Um, again, um, you can do that without using a mixer. You can actually do that directly on your machine. So one of the things that we do, again, the main jewel is going to come up. It's going to be a great, the, you can use your PC as actually the HDMI output, and then you can then input it back in to the machine using the USB. And then you can go into the Skype meeting broadcast client and select like this device as the actual video input. And so that's one way that you can actually then play any pre-recorded content on your machine. As a best practice, we recommend that you kind of do a couple of dry runs before the actual live show in order to see how that works. Um, what else can you use the main jewel for? There's like one other scenario that I think is like super important. Ah, demos. <laughs> so here at Microsoft, we do lots of demos. We want to showcase the technology, and you might want to showcase something that you're doing. Um, so definitely using um, a Magewell or this HDMI capture device as a way to like actually do screen recordings and screenshots. Um, so if you want to show your PC or your desktop, or if you want to go to a website and show someone a click path on a website, using this and then using uh, and then switching that as a video input source is um, definitely uh, an option to do. One trick that I want to mention is that, you know, usually if you're going to be doing multiple things, if you're going to have someone running a PowerPoint presentation and then someone doing a demo, having multiple PCs is probably as a best practice to do that. So have one PC dedicated to the video input and have another PC dedicated to, um, to the demo, as an example, as a best practice. So just so that you can have like a nice flow in between and you can have someone in the background switching between uh, the various content at a different at the at different times so um, that's the base case scenario again so what we covered today is like we covered uh, a base case scenario where you can just get started by going to skype.broadcast.com and you can have your PC, have a peripheral audio device and some video and get started. If you want to start entering uh, multiple um, audio sources and then you want to add some creative elements, you might want to have a one, two or three or multiple camera shoot, we definitely recommend that you kind of go to the mid-level, invest in some equipment and some people behind you who have the technical aptitude to start pulling all these different sources together. That's one of the things we love is that it's it's sort of um, it's a great democratizer. Uh, anyone can can use Skype meeting broadcast, so it can be you know like you said somebody just sitting at their desk, um, you know with with just their their laptop all the way up to a high end production um, and everything in between. So you know even just a, a, a modest investment in a, in a few basic tools uh, can really up your production game and and you're still able to stream out a you know to all your employees or or anyone you want you want to uh, even your customers. 
um, you know, without having to, to go through um, an entire giant production like the, like what we, we often do for our tier one events. Yeah, and you know, from, what, from a setup perspective, it's really easy too. Once you go to skype.broadcast.com, you know, uh, and you click, go through the different configurations, you get a URL that you can send out to your guests. And, uh, and when your, uh, your guests receive that URL and they can click on it, if they join early, uh, the broadcast hasn't started, so they'll just, uh, they won't see anything. Um, but if they, uh, once you click start in the Skype, meeting broadcast client, they'll start to see everything that you produce there. Um, one of the tips and tricks that we suggest is uh, sometimes people tend to show up to an, an episode early, so you might want to have um, a PowerPoint presentation or a pre-recorded video running in the background as a great way to engage them and let them know that they're early and things are going to get started. We typically do that um, about 10 minutes before every show here, so it's like a really great uh, tip and trick. And I know that we do that here at Microsoft. Actually, it was the best Ab practice absolutely. that I got from you. Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah, we always we always do that so that people. Yeah, people like to join early, and they know that you know they're in the right place, and that they're you know that the presentation's about to start, like you said, and and that that things are working, that they're able to see the video. Yeah. Um, then they know that you know they're ready for you know as soon as it starts, they're ready to watch. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. So um, we dropped a blog a couple of days ago, and in there I said if anyone had any questions that they wanted covered during the show, to make sure that you let me know. I actually got a few questions that Jeff, I'd like to ask you awesome. some best practices on how to get this done. So the first question that I have is, uh, what makes uh, how is Skype meeting broadcast different from other streaming technologies? You know, what, what the thing that we love, and, and we've been using it for um, about two years now, since we started using it actually just a little bit before it even released. Um, just to help test it, and uh, it was just so simple to, to get going. If you have an Office 365 subscription, it's just there, um, and you know it gives us all the, the critical features that we were actually looking elsewhere for, um, and kind of struggling to find all in one place. Um, the, the biggest thing for us is is always security, right? We want to make sure that if it's an internal event, that it meets our security standards, and this came with that out of the box. Um, because it's part of Office 365, it's also integrated with Active Directory and uh, credentials, so people are logging in with the real credentials, and then you know the the feed is actually encrypted, so that we can make sure that it's it's properly secured. Uh, we've seen a lot of other platforms where you have to use a different username and password there than what you might use for your corp credentials, um, and then that's that's a, a kind of a, a hassle for people and also a potential security risk. Um, and then additionally, sometimes it's password protected but not actually encrypted, meaning that um, you know it is fairly easily easily hacked. Um, and if it is, you know, secure information, you want to keep it that way. So right there was one of the huge things. Um, another thing that we love is the interactive components. Um, so we use things like we, we love to use the Pulse, we love to use Yammer integration, um, so, you know, and the Q&A module so that that way um, it's not always just a one-way feed. It can really make our audience part of the, um, our remote audience a part of the actual experience. Yeah, cool. Yeah, you said something that um, was really important. It's just like, it's one is integrated into Office 365, the authentication, the encryption, the security protocols are already baked into the service so that they don't have, you don't have to really worry about if someone got a handle, a uh, hold of the URL, you don't have to worry about like rogue folks tuning in uh, to the broadcast. And you can also open it up if you want, if, if that's okay. And if you want your customers to join like we do here with Teams on Air and you want them to join, you can open up the URL and then they can get in without any authentication worries or handles. So um, that's uh, one of the main difference. Um, the last thing that I'd mention is just cost. So third party streaming services, that's not free. <laughs> right, <laughs> like you have to pay above and beyond what you're already paying for uh, today in order to do that. The 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 cool thing about this is within Office 365, it's automatically included in your subscription, and you can just turn it on, and it and it works by default for your employees. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, you can also turn that off if you don't want all your employees doing that. But you know, most people you know let it on and see how it works in the organization, and and, and it starts catching fire. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next question that I've got is that um, we've noticed buffering issues when we're running and broadcast for internal meetings. And so what are some of the best practices on networking and, and um, making sure that that goes away? Yeah, you know, that's that's a great question and something that, you know, we've we've been through a little bit here at Microsoft as well. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of field sites, like we said, 140 and, um, you know, in different countries with different infrastructure and being able to stream at scale to all of our employees. 
um, is definitely a concern. Um, one of the things that's awesome is that um, there are some SDN solutions, or, or ECDN as they're known, um, that are integrated with, or, or available with, with Skype Meeting Broadcast. Um, uh, Hive and Collective both have options for that. Um, and what that does is help m minimize the load on your internal network by using peering technology um, so that you don't have all these feeds coming across your firewall back out from the internet. Um, you know, that's really been, especially for some of our remote regions, um, kind of a game changer for us. Um, in addition, you know, I think it's, it's on, the, on the production side, what we do, as we mentioned, is having our machines on two different networks that are both joined to the meeting, so that way if we have a localized network issue, we're also able to switch between those and not go off the air. Yeah. Uh, if you guys are interested in learning about Hive or Collective, you can check out the URL below um, and feel free to drop some comments in the comment button or uh, leave a, Q uh, a comment in the Q&A and, we'll, um, and maybe we'll bring Hive or Collective back on the show. Uh, the last question that we have time for is thinking about in-room audiences versus online. Um, sometimes we have some folks that are in the room, uh, and then we also have several hundred folks who are online. How do we handle that when there's a 30-second delay? Yeah, you know, um, and people ask about that quite a bit, you know, that, that delay. And, and what we found is it's really a non-issue for us um, because, the, you know, if you were trying to watch it right there in the room, you would notice that. But anybody else isn't going to notice that. Even with um, the interactive components, it's not a problem. Um, some of what we do is, you know, we try and make sure that our, um, you know, in-person audience, we do a lot of interactive Q&As there, and we have maybe even mics set up for people to, to go and ask questions. Um, and we want that interactivity there, uh, but remotely we'll have people asking questions via Yammer, and then we'll have someone dedicated there in the room who's forwarding those questions on to the, the people up, you know, up on stage uh, that are presenting. Um, and by doing that, you know, the people you know, around the world are able to participate and ask their questions um, just the same as anyone in the room would be able to. Yeah. Um, so you know, we've really found that the, the delay doesn't cause a problem there because um, they're still able to ask the questions just like they would any other time. They still get them answered. Um, so it's not, a, not really a downside. It yeah. just means it's going to be that much more robust in the streaming. Um, there's more buffer, buffer built in, basically, so that it's more likely to get to you intact and have without you seeing buffering wheels and things like that. Yeah. So one thing that I want to mention is that the, the time delay is going to happen. This happens with any streaming services because it takes time to send the signal, encode it uh, in our content delivery network, and send it back and stream it out to the different PCs. So it's built in. So if you have an in-room audience and you want to project the speaker who's on the stage, um, you actually want to project the Skype Meeting Broadcast client and not the URL. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. In fact, typically what we'll do in the rooms, um, you know, for our use cases, we'll actually just take an output from the from the camera and, and, and maybe put that on some monitors so people see that and then and or put up, you know, a PowerPoint feed or something like that. Um, but yeah, you definitely, the only, I guess that, that would be the, the only use case you need to be aware of is, yeah, do not you know, display in room the actual broadcast because it will be delayed. But yeah, if you're showing what's on your Skype for Business client, that actually is real time. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about, uh, and I'd love for you to talk about, is the audio. Um, and sometimes if they're using mics and there's clapping, you might hear someone clap. Uh, are there some ways that we could mitigate the, the background noise? Yeah, so you know, one of the things we found is, is um, Skype for Business, of course, was, was built as a, as a UC tool. And, and um, so it's built for people sitting at their, at their laptop or in a conference room where there is a lot of background noise. So there's some inherent noise adjustments that, you know, it's trying to minimize background noise automatically. Um, the problem is, is that when you have something like Skype meeting broadcast and you're doing actual events where there might be applause, the, the algorithms might actually think that's noise and try and and reduce that. Um, so there actually is a way to address that, and there's a registry key that um, I'm sure we can put up lower third right here to tell people yeah. where to go to get that. <laughs> and, and what that does is actually um, disable some of that functionality um, on your Skype for Business client so that when you're using Skype meeting broadcast, um, it's not going to attenuate the volume as much, and it's going to have a lot less impact on things like applause or music or other things that might regularly be identified as noise uh, yeah. by the client. Yeah, definitely check that out so that you can learn how to uh, activate that reg key setting. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on the show, and thank you, you uh, thank you for allowing us to come into your into the broadcast and streaming center. This is pretty cool. This is pretty amazing. Yeah. Thank you for having me. 
All right, guys, I hope that was helpful for you. And that's how we do it. That's how we do this episode that we have here going on today. That's how we do large tier events. And if you don't have a production crew or lots of complicated uh, or advanced equipment, you can do it with your PC uh, and, and an internet access. So that's it. Now, the next section that I, before we close, I'd like to cover is uh, the roadmap. What's happening next? Uh, and like I said last week, when we got covered the Skype for Business to Microsoft Teams capabilities roadmap, um, uh, the content that I'm about to share with you is our expectations. Um, and uh, it's certainly a vision, but dates are subject to change. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. But I'd love to kind of show um, um, what, what we hope to bring you uh, in the upcoming weeks. So this is the meetings roadmap. You've seen this before if you watched our episode last week or if you um, took a look at our blog that we released two weeks ago. Um, Skype meeting broadcast falls on the meeting uh, roads map. Uh, and we expect that the capabilities that you have with Skype meeting broadcast be uh, eventually show up in Microsoft Teams. Uh, and we expect that to happen in um, in the second quarter of calendar year 2018, so at the end of the year. And when that happens, what you should expect to see is that we now have this back end, uh, new back end modern infrastructure. And so that infrastructure is gonna uh, enable te Microsoft Teams to do a couple of things for us. From a scheduling perspective, that means actually scheduling the broadcast. Um, today that's done uh, in, um, broadcast.skype.com, we help to move those capabilities into Microsoft Teams and an Outlook. So that would be a, a nice, easier way for people to discover as well as actually plan uh, Skype uh, meeting broadcast sessions. From a production perspective, again, that's all the producer capabilities, turning on and enabling translation and transcription, being able to integrate the Pulse or the Yammer integration, all that will be able to be done within the Microsoft Teams client. From an attendee perspective, you should be able to ideally see it in the Microsoft Teams or in a browser if the uh, attendee doesn't have the Teams client. And then finally, uh, today, the videos that are published on Skype Meeting Broadcast are using, use the Office 365 video network, and then that will also be moving over to Microsoft Stream. And that allows us to do a lot more intelligent capabilities like building in facial recognition, again, the, the translation and transcription, but being able to search translation and transcription for broadcast will, uh, will be also be there. So. Um, um, those are what we expect to see. Also from a more granular perspective in terms of the feature matrix, um, there's tons of features that are available today. Some of the big things, questions customers ask, like, do we intend to increase the limit? Yes, so, um, you know, we're hoping to eventually over time increase the limit to about uh, 25,000 um, attendees instead of 10,000. So that allows you to do a, a lot more people to connect. Uh, we talked about some of the scheduling and porting capabilities uh, and um, also um, producing. Um, we hope to, one of the questions that we get is having to do this on a non-PC device. Uh, and because it'll be on a modern infrastructure and back end, we'll be able to perhaps do that on um, in, in the new version when it comes. So. Uh, these are a lot of the features and functionalities. I'll make sure to post this in a blog post so that you can see it in more details. And if you have any follow-up questions, I'm happy to address them in the blog post. But that's uh, Microsoft uh, Skype meeting broadcast and the capabilities. So we're out of time, unfortunately. And uh, there's one question that I uh, got uh, several times in the Q&A that I, I want to make sure that we address, and that's licensing. Exactly you know, which license uh, enables you to get this. If you any of the licenses that have Skype, me, Skype for Business in them, so that includes Skype, um, Skype for Business Online Plan 2, or any of the enterprise SKUs, which is E1, E3, or E5, get you access to that. So, and again, if you want to be able to log in and test it out, it's turned on by default. So you can go to broadcast.skype.com and just start testing it out and play around with it. So I hope this is enough to get you started. Um, we definitely, there's tons more to go into, so we just ran out of time. So if you want to go into things like the user interface and how to actually schedule and um, play around with that, or if you want to have one of our content, um, our 
our network providers come in and kind of talk about some of the uh, additional capabilities that you can use to have to have increased performance on your network. Uh, definitely drop me a comment and let me know, and then we could definitely bring them back in and talk about that. So uh, I want to take a t take some time before we close to tell you what's happening in the uh, in our next episode. The next episode will we will have we'll be talking about increasing business agility um, with and, and collaboration with Microsoft Teams. We'll ha actually have a customer come on who's going to talk about some user case scenarios. So how they're actually using Teams in their environment uh, and what are the scenarios. So we'll go over some use case scenarios that can really help you so that you can start imagining. Uh, for your organization, how you can use Skype meeting, or excuse me, how you can use Microsoft Teams. So that will be, we'll be on a new schedule because of the Thanksgiving holiday here in the US. We will not be on Friday. We'll actually be on Tuesday of that week. So Tuesday the 21st at 9 a.m. So make sure that you mark the change on your calendar. And of course, you can always watch us on demand if you miss the episode. So see you in two weeks.